Welcome back to Following Noadon, a Stormlight podcast. This week is episode 28. We are doing chapters 13 through 16. We're jumping into part two of Words of Radiance. Paul, how are you feeling about jumping into part two? And what are your two words for this episode? I'm doing good this evening. So my two words are unorthodox and torn. Uh, unorthodox is partly for our Adolin chapter in the way he handles his his uh, fancy duel, um, as well as you know, kind of the way Shalon is handling herself with with uh, Tavlakov. Maybe not super unorthodox, but definitely unorthodox for her. Um, and then I have Torn, which is referring to our Kaladin chapter. And Kaladin's emotions. So, gotcha, Elliot. How are we feeling? Feeling good. Feeling a little nervous, maybe actually, for our characters and and where they're heading. I feel like we have a lot of air that I'm not sure how they're going to resolve themselves. So, a little apprehensive going into going into our, our storyline here. But my two words for this episode might be fairly obvious, but maybe quite not so obvious. We'll talk about them. Uh, the two words I have are. Rules and duels. Ooh, rules and duels. Okay. All right, let's discuss these words. All right, so I think we all know what duels refers to here, but you can go ahead and start there, and we can go from there. Yeah, Shalon's duels of wits, easy. Yep. <laughs> well, actually, more than you think, maybe. So, so duels obviously for for Adolin and the 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 duel that we see him do, but at least in in chapter fifteen, Shalon and Entavlakov seem to be dueling a little bit or, or sparbly, and so. Adolin's not the only one dueling here uh, in these in these chapters that we see, but then I also had rules as as my other word. I specifically for for Adolin and his his claim of I didn't break any rules as he wins his duel in a rather maybe unorthodox fashion, as you as you say, Paul. But then. We're also kind of learning about some other rules in the rest of the chapters. You know, Shalon is is learning more about the rules of how pattern works and and how her her illumination seems to be working. And also, Kaladin seems to be learning more about kind of the rules of of light eyes in the the dueling arena and how kind of the ardents fit into that whole picture. So, lots of rules and a fair amount of people dueling. Gotcha. Uh, Paul, you want to talk about your words a little bit more? Yeah, I kind of jumped the gun with them a little bit. So Torn um, is mostly for, uh, in the Kaladin chapter, we see a lot of his internal struggle, uh, which might turn into an external struggle before long. Uh, with Amaram coming back, he is very upset. Um, and so that's mostly referring to, to him he does kind of come to his senses and realize, you know, just because he's with Dalinar doesn't make Dalinar bad. Um, Dalinar is still a, a good man, but uh, he obviously despises Amram. Um, and Unorthodox is mostly talking about Adolin's, uh duel, where he mostly just beats him to a pulp instead of sword fighting, mm -hmm. um, which was somewhat frowned upon but you're right he didn't break any rules um that as well as shalon really taking a step out of her comfort zone she mentions that tavalkov has not doesn't know she's shy or kind of a has a, a kind of timid personality i guess and so she's pulling out all the stops with bargaining or arguing or mm -hmm. persuading him yeah so that's why uh, i would use that gotcha 
I want to talk about chapter 13 and 15 together. Uh, it's They're two Shalon chapters. It's pretty easy to do that with. Jumping into chapter 13, Shalon has decided a couple things. She's decided to pick up where Yasna left off. She's going to keep going to the Shattered Plains. She really doesn't have a choice, I guess. She's she's banking on the fact she's banking on this betrothal with Adolin pretty heavily because she talks with Tavlakov and says, I have great wealth, but I don't have it yet. You got to get me to the Shattered Plains first. As a reader, we know that it's not entirely true because, I mean, her house is kind of destitute and the great wealth she's referring to is actually Adolin's money, not her money. So she's hoping that the the betrothal is still on and when she gets there, Adolin will solve all of her problems. So you say that is banking on on Adolin's wealth. You, you mean that literally too. She she's literally looking for, you know, the financial backing of her betrothed to to get her out of this uh this problem that she she's hit into. Uh, I guess I'll jump straight to Eight thoughts actually on this. this. This it's not even in this chapter, but we can touch on it real quick. It's in the Adolin chapter. I, I was surprised that we got a little bit of his thoughts on it, and he doesn't super opposed to this. He he seems like eager and and, and anticipating Shalon getting there, and he seems excited about that, which is not the the reaction I was maybe expecting from from Adolin there. From the the vibe I get from Adolin is he's a little overconfident doesn't really know how to talk to girls he can't keep keep one around for more than a couple weeks because he just keeps offending them and they have one nothing to do with him afterwards but if if he could just be skip the dating process and go to engaged then that girl would be stuck with him so he could probably he could probably go for that We'll we'll see what he thinks when when she rolls up in her torn dress and no shoes and hair all all messed up. It's going to be a very interesting scene, I think, when when Shalon does make it to the, the Shattered Plains. I'm really interesting interested how this is going to go down. We mentioned it earlier too. It all just depends on who she talks to first, right? Yeah. That is, if she's meeting Navani, Navani might be like, "Oh, you poor you poor thing, let me." Let me fix you up. And then if she meets Dalinar first, Dalinar is not going to care at all. Like, he'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm... Oh, you. I, I know who you are. Goodbye. Like, I don't... You don't help me at all. I mean, that's a little cold, but Dalinar's a very methodical guy. If she meets Kaladin first, Kaladin's going to, I don't know, insult her in some way because he hates all light eyes, so... Yeah, True. But Shalon's got to get there first, and she's she's stuck right now with traitors, which seems like a fairly precarious place for for her to be. Uh, originally, when she first fell in th- with them, she she kind of reasoned that she was fairly safe. That they can't really sell her as a slave because she's a, a light eyes. You know, that's kind of a built in safety net for her. But as she realizes, I think it's in fifteen. They, they maybe don't have the best intentions for her after all, and they maybe are, are going to try and sell her or make some kind of money on this ultimately. And I, I said I was nervous a little bit going into this, and, and, and this was, was maybe part of why, because I'm not quite sure how this is going to work out for sure. Tavlakov almost doesn't give her the key when she asks to be in the in one of the slave wagons to be turned into her carriage he he kind of like locks her in there and then looks at the key for a second and then gives it to her so he he's not uh he's one of our morally gr- morally gray characters if you will so i think we can definitely nail down the the story archetype that we're on here with with shalon we, we mentioned this before when in the chapter where Yasna died about kind of the 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 story path or the hero's journey if you will of kind of the the, the apprentice taking the robe of the master 
you know, the, the master taking the apprentice under their wing, but then meeting an untimely death and the apprentice kind of taking on the legacy of the, of, of their mentor. And this is, this seems to be exactly that. Shalon mentions that she's going to take on this, this quest that Yasna had to, to find the link to, to your or to find the past, to, to unlock these answers. And, and so Shalon definitely has, I think, a purpose now. She has a, a goal to work towards, but problems to solve along the way too, for sure. Speaking of, of Yasna, we get, get a kind of a tender moment between, or with Shalon thinking about Yasna. Shalon has kind of shoved away her, her grief of Yasna until this chapter, as she does with a lot of, a lot of things. She just shoves them away and doesn't think about them at all. But when she finds Yasna's, Yasna's portrait of Yasna that Shalon did for her. She's surprised mm-hmm. that she, she's surprised that she kept it because that's very, uh, that's a very human thing to do. And Yas and Shalon thinks of Yasna as not real, not real. This <laughs> yeah. pedestal over here. So, yeah. No, there was like kind of a. It was kind of like a tender moment almost. It's like, oh, like she, Yasna did care, or at least care enough to keep this and stuff. So that was kind of a, a tender moment almost. We've had a couple of those moments actually so far in Words of Radiance because Shalon walked in on Yasna and Yasna didn't have her professional face on and she could tell she was attracting fear spread. She was deathly afraid of what was coming of the Everstorm or whatever and Shalon's like oh you actually have emotions it's becoming more clear that Yasna definitely put on a persona to to be who she was and that there is that there does seem to be a softer side a more tender side of of Yasna that we didn't really get to see much of We get to know a little bit more about Pattern and what he can do in this in this chapter. So I'm going to want to pick this up. So we learn we learn a couple things about about Pattern. The first thing that I actually didn't even put in the outline we we learn that his name is not even really a, a name or a word. It's a bunch of numbers, and I thought that was interesting. We wondered before about what pattern's name might be we noted that you know shallan named him pattern right as opposed to him you know knowing his own name it appears he does know his own name it's just like a series of numbers like a serial code or, or something like that like a that that i don't know why that if that's important or anything but it was it was interesting for sure i, I personally was was a little bit surprised just I was fully expecting him to just not have a name. He seemed very ambiguous and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I was confused. So I guess whatever he, wherever he comes from, I know he comes from Shades more, but I mean, we don't know that much. Um, that I don't know. I guess it's very methodolog- or method methodological, very uh, number oriented. Um, way of thinking whoever's in charge there because uh, I'm sure he didn't come up with that on his own that he was given that series of numbers as his name and stuff so I'm kind of it makes me a little more curious about the other spren like pattern and where they came from um, yeah do, do all cryptics have just numbers like do they just yeah. Number them as they come off the, the cryptic <laughs> manufacturing <available>. line. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. I I do wonder though if you know, can can we trust that from from pattern? Is that a, a to, he seems to like lies quite, a, true. quite a bit. So I'm I'm not quite sure if I can take what, what pattern says at, at face value. But I've been struggling over these chapters and, and previous chapters to to get a grip on like how pattern talks and how he processes things. Cause he 
word lie to mean different things. It, it, it seems like sometimes he seems to be referring to actual lies, but then other times maybe not so much. Like there's a section in here in chapter 13 where he says like, you cannot keep all lies, only the most important ones. And, and a few other places where he just, he, he seems to use that word in a, in a different way. And as I was trying to figure out like how to understand the way he talks, I realized maybe you can, maybe you can interpret that word a little bit differently. And, and, and shout out to one of our, one of our listeners on, on YouTube. If you go back to our, our episode 2024, our listener, uh, gazeboist, I hope I'm saying your, your username right there actually commented on this, on this very thing and, and suggested that maybe, you know, know the right way to think about it, but maybe more of like information is the right way to tackle it. And I, I kind of am coming to that same conclusion myself of if you kind of replace lies with the word information in a lot of pattern sentences, they seem to make more sense. So I, I don't know if I want to apply, apply that all across the board, because it does seem like he's talking about specifically lies sometimes, but other times not. So maybe that's a different way to think about him and his type of spren. Sometimes, sometimes he wants truths to... Yeah, to go to Shadesmar. Sometimes he wants lies, or sometimes he enjoys lies, but he also uses it like not entirely grammatically correct. So, right. Yeah, pattern is confusing, very confusing. Our bizarre kiddo, as as Paul has coined. Indeed. I mean, it's definitely accurate. Definitely an accurate description of pattern. I agree. Our Mister. I don't know what his number is, but it's probably like 3.14151. <laughs> Wait, 3.14159265. That's as far as I know pi. But yes, that's as, that's what I'm going to guess. He is pi. I don't know if this is bad, but so it, it depicts him right as a little pattern on the ground or whatever. That's how she mm -hmm. saw him. And I thought of the pi symbol. So I <laughs> like in my head reading that. So maybe he is literally pi and... You know, Could be. One for Anyways, unimportant. <laughs> uh, so on on the topic of of pattern and and quote lies, it seems like it's more of like you know, like you were saying, it's more like information or truths. He talks about Shalon and how I guess she is. Yeah, yeah. There's a a very short little quote that you wrote down in the outline, I think, Elliot, of like, it is the lies that drew me. Um, but I'm pretty sure Pattern is talking about this as... It's in reference to, as far as we know, the traumatic incident in Chapter 10 that's so, like, wild that we don't really know. But we kind of get, like, a mention of that. And I thought it was interesting... Pattern says that uh, an incident like that would break most people, but that Shalon didn't break. She cracked. Right. And I'm kind of curious to see if, if you thought anything of that, Elliot. I didn't take it as too like, oh, this is going to mean something big. But obviously we know Shalon has been through a lot and it's affected her character. But I don't know if we know how much it will continue to affect their character, if there's going to be this, like, breaking point or something like that that will happen with her. Yeah, I think you're totally onto something there. I mean, we've... A recurring, you know, part of Shalon's story, all the way from when we first met her, has been really big into lies. We She was living the lie of becoming Yasna's ward all the while trying to steal her soul cast but we're learning that maybe her life even before that was a lie because because about you know i was drawn to you your family was what drew me to you i was i was sent to you because of the lies so we are not quite sure there but it seems like that's why pattern is there because her life is a lie and we don't know how we don't know how her life is a lie or why it is we we got that brief glimpse back in that really short chapter, not enough to quite, you know, solve the case as we, we put on our, our detective hats there, but enough to really get suspicious about what's happening there and, and how pattern plays a part in it. And I don't know that either. 
some good thoughts from from both of you nice so we do learn about a new uh ability that that pattern has or a new rule that he plays by apparently he can imitate other people's voices perfectly which i i can envision this being a, a comical scene in in a station of shallan just being you know completely scared out of her wits when Tavlaka's voice, you know, starts speaking to her right you know, over her shoulder when lo and behold, it's not, it's, it's pattern relaying the conversation. He just, he just heard. So, so that's interesting. I, Paul, what do you think about that new ability? I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, I didn't notice that, but that's incredible. <laughs> and honestly, I, I listened to this chapter several times. I don't know how I didn't catch on to that, but Maybe it's because I was hearing Tavlankov's voice like in the audiobook, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. She sends yeah, she sends Pattern to spy on Tavlakov and one of the mm-hmm. other slavers. And Pattern I comes back that. with uh with Tavlakov's voice and talks to Shalon and Shalon's like, What? Yeah. That actually makes me super excited because if Pattern does that I'm I'm just going to make make a, a step here and say that Shulana is going to be able to use that at some point. You know, definitely she's going to that's going to come in handy at some point. Um or maybe that's part of her maybe that's her second soul casting thing she can mimic voices or something or she'll learn to do that. I don't know if that's the case, probably not, but that's so really cool and Shulana is definitely the character too utilize something like that in a really major way i could see i could see something happening there so i think that's super cool i'm a big fan of pattern i'm totally with you i think something big i think shalom maybe will do some crazy things with this because i mean if you think about it we just learned that she has this ability to create like illusions and we even see in this scene where she like is is trying to intimidate Tavlakov and she starts to glow. And I think it even describes like her dress starts to appear more regal or, or less torn. She starts to like take on this image that's not necessarily her. Kind of take that to it to its extreme. Could Shalon, you know, create some sort of illusion on herself to where she looks like a different person and then pattern could speak with the voice of that person? You know, Shalon could completely impersonate someone like Yasna, maybe. You know, she's been studying Yasna. She's even been trying to become like a lot of the the role that, you know, the persona that Yasna has. She's been trying to do the things that, that Yasna has done, like uh, put a face on that's, you know, lack of emotions and trying to, you know, be, be confident and persuasive. And could this all be leading up to her, like, impersonating Yasna somehow? I... Uh, maybe I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that i was actually thinking what if I, I didn't think about the illusion aspect but like whenever she gets to the shattered planes i was thinking like for whatever reason like they're talking through a tent or something like that and she like uses yasna's voice yeah and and like talks to people and does stuff with that power of like oh this is yasna like tell her everything you know we can say whatever mm-hmm. And stuff, but I didn't even think about the illusion part. If so, then yeah, she could do anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and that I, seems pretty far beyond like her abilities right now. Mm-hmm. That this might be something that she's not quite able to do yet. Although, you know, maybe if you take the visual aspect of it, maybe it's you know someone's listening in through a through a tent wall or or through a door or something like that. She could pretend to have a conversation with yasna and have you know pattern speak that that side of the the conversation that could have some interesting near-term effects this feels like the equivalent in the way of kings whenever kaladin like sticks the like he sticks like a money pouch to a barrel or something mm-hmm. yeah there's something who's like whoa everyone's like oh my gosh and stuff and obviously it can do a lot more than that but those kind of the first one yeah. of the first things um and this is might be roughly that equivalent. Good stuff. Good stuff. Was that your crazy theory that you had on the outline, Elliot? 
that was my crazy theory that I had on the outline. It, it's not, it's less of a crazy theory and more of like a, what if, you know, what if Shalon could develop this ability being able to impersonate people with perfection, you know, have an illusion that makes her look exactly like that person and have pattern who can perfectly imitate their voice. You know, that, that could have big implications on, you know, plot lines going forward. If, if Shalon's able to do that kind of stuff. Well, Dalinar told me to do this. No, I didn't. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I could see that. Exactly. And like you said, Paul, that, that totally fits in, you know, be a character to do something like that. You know, Kaladin might have, you know, maybe like a struggle over whether he should, you know, impersonate someone and, and lie like that. Probably not going to think twice about about using that to, to do something she feels like she needs to do. Any closing thoughts on Shalon as she progresses towards the Shattered Plains? There is one other thing. We got another mention of our character. Probably everyone's favorite character, the stick. I'm pretty <laughs> sure they mentioned, they mentioned it again. She's talking to one of the other work, like slavers she's working with, Tavlakov, and mm -hmm. I don't remember the quote exactly, but they're I talking about... I can quote about... it for you if you want. Okay. <laughs> I so... appreciate it, because he like, makes fun of her stick or something like that. And Yeah. Like, hey. He says, I'll bet you think I'm dumb, as dumb as that stick. And Shalon says, stop insulting my stick. Or at least she wants to say that. And <laughs> yes. she doesn't. Exactly. That stick is not dumb. That's true. That stick has more staunch stick-like behavior than <laughs> any stick ever. Than that. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious that that was put in there. Honestly, that was, that was really good. Kate Redding's delivery of it is really good, too. She's like, stop insulting my stick. <laughs> yeah. speaking of talking to inanimate objects we can jump to chapter 14 where we have an Adolin point of view chapter we've seen Adolin in a couple point of views in the way of kings but he's never had a full chapter to himself it's always been like shared with Dalinar um, but we have a full point of view Adolin chapter and he's talking to his sword is is when we, we come in here. Does someone want to pick this up? I I did note this this down just because almost you know, section. We we get this scene where, where Adolin's talking to his sword, just just kind of prepping for this duel. You you get the impression he's just trying to you know, get himself in the right headspace for for what he's about to what he's about to do, just like any other, you know, athlete or performer, just trying to get themselves you know, psyched up for what they're about to do. So I, I didn't think too much of it in that sense, but then Adolin kind of even thinks to himself a little bit like, oh, I'm, I'm talking to my sword. You know, this is kind of, it's kind of goofy. It's not like they're alive, but I paused on that right there. It's like, based on everything we've read so far, it would not shock me in the slightest if shard blades are in fact alive, if they do have sprens or consciousness of some kind, and they really are kind of, living things if you will so adolin clearly doesn't think they are but it all to hear that they that they they are alive i i feel similar to that i think i think there's like a toy story approach <laughs> that like when the either when they're not looking or like you know the shard blades aren't always like physical right whenever they're right. like off and shard blade land they're you know they're partying it up they're having a good time and stuff until they're summoned they're always ready but you know they have their own lives down there i bet well actually so. they're not always ready it takes them 10 heartbeats to get to them so that's true that's that's <laughs> true it's true they're all chilling in the pub together and like oh, oh gosh, crap, i've been like, summoned oh that's my buzz gotta go, gotta gotta go. go. yeah <laughs> they've all got exactly. pagers on the counter yeah, exactly. You got my tab, right? I'll be back. I promise. <laughs> yeah, I can totally see that being the case. We yeah, we have talked to to sticks. We've talked to boats. Why not? Like, why not uh, shard blades? I'm like, oh, I've got work. I'll be. I just been called <laughs> in. Like, just been called in to work. Yep. Exactly. I'll be back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. 
I'm fully sold on that one. That's if that's not confirmed already, then I don't know what is. <laughs> I mean, if a stick has a spread, a shard blade's gotta have one. I mean, true, sure, sure, definitely. But anyway, Adolin gets out there with his his shard blade and pretty definitively wins in a matter of seconds. This is this is actually one of my favorite scenes from this section of Words of Radiance because I can just imagine all of the light eyes are have dressed up in their their Sunday best, you know, to go to the go to the arena to go watch the duels. And this one's actually for shards. People are so excited. People have been talking that Adolin's actually going to be dueling for shards. Is Adolin as good as everyone says he is? He hasn't dueled in so long. And he walks into this arena, gets into Wind's stance, and kind of stops himself. It's like, no, no, we're, we're not doing this. Turns around and just beats him over the head like five times, and the, the, thing, the thing's over in like 45 seconds. And it just makes me smile to just to think about it that 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 that's the that's the first duel that you're gonna have adolin show off as just beating somebody over the head relentlessly that's so funny to me i i did think it was really funny especially how so i knew it was gonna be like that or, or kind of so it talked about how it was kind of hard for adolin to get this duel mm-hmm. like he had to risk his plate and blade in exchange for the other guy only risking his blade in this duel. And so there's so much, like, I don't know, work that went into setting this up. And then Adolin's like, because he just needed to get the duel. He knew he was going to, like, destroy this this light-eyes kid, you know? He, right. he knew it was going to be... So he, like, hits the guy with his shard blade. The guy drops his shard blade. It vanishes. And so he's like, okay, like, there goes mine. And just, like, beats him to pulp pretty much beats his plate up he's like okay <laughs> it, it was wild and, and i love how the the like the judge is like screaming at him too <laughs> like what are you doing you know just you know, Adolin kind of standing over there just like kicking him you know he doesn't even have his his shard blade out anymore he's just like mercilessly kicking him while he's on the ground and the judge is like whoa you can't do that and Adolin just turns like why not you know, what rule did I break? And right. the judge is just, you know, dumbfounded like, well, uh, you, you were supposed to break, th- only broke two. And then Adolin you know, rips a piece off and just crushes it. He's like, there, three, you happy? <laughs> exactly. And Renarin got a shard blade out of it, so. He did. That's That's pretty cool. I'm very happy for him. I have to say I really liked having an Adolin chapter. It wasn't super long or anything. It, it was kind of fun. I'm glad they gave it to us. I, I assumed it was going to be Adolin goes up to this duel. We hear later in that in our chapter, like, oh, how'd your duel go? Right. It's like, oh, it won. You know, but kind of getting to see that and how <laughs> ridiculous it was was, uh, was really fun. I'm So Adolin's planning to duel more White Eyes, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of his thing right now um and i'm really excited i don't know i'm assuming it's going to keep happening but i'm really excited to to see that what are your guys's thoughts i kind of want to go a little bit sidetracked here what are your guys's thoughts right now on renarin we renarin is not one of our main characters and he's adolin's little brother by i want to say six years i think it is and like just what are your thoughts on Renarin at this stage in the, in the book he's he's just like the i think of him as a stereotypical little brother character like not super involved but probably will later on is the way i'm taking it i think he'll become more major later gotcha. um, something will happen and maybe he has to step up uh he seems like more of a from what I know, he's not a big he he's not even like trained at fighting, is he, or like barely. Um so maybe he'll have a different approach to the whole situation, kinda like Shalon, I guess, does. Um a more studious approach. Um 
I'm not sure. I think he's really cool, but we don't know that much about him. He's just like younger Colin. Right. Yeah, I feel like we haven't seen maybe enough of him to to really judge his his character yet. But in the times that we have seen him, he does seem to be a bit of a of a and he seems to he he tends to kind of chime in with uh you know, oh but did you think about this kind of kind of angle? I think we saw that maybe a couple of times in like when Dalinar is having his of rage or whatnot or his his visions. And then here again, even in, in this chapter where Adon is talking about how he how much he doesn't like Kaladin, Renarin kind of chimes in with like well, but is it just because he orders you around on the battlefield kind of thing? You know, Renard, right. he, he tends to kind of chime in with a, a bit of wisdom here and here and there. So I kind of have this image of him as the kind of more calculated, a little more reserved, a little, I'm going to think this through, whereas Adolin is maybe kind of more of the charges headlong in without thinking too much about it. He's almost like, he's a little like Tian, almost. They can kind of make that comparison. I've actually talked to people who've made the same comparison that you are making right now. And how Brandon Sanderson, as as far as like as far as this point in the book, he's done the little brother trope twice. He did it with Tien and how Tien needs to be protected. And he's done it with Renarin as well. How Renarin he wants to go into battle, but he freezes. He they've talked about his condition a couple times and how that's that's how he hasn't really been he hasn't been trained um and how he isn't really involved in uh in plateau runs or anything they talk about his condition that he has like a blood condition or something and it's interesting that he would do it not only once with tn who needs protection with kaladin but again with renarin who needs protection with dalinar and adolin Yeah, I'm curious to see if Renarin is going to be able to actually make use of his his shard plate and and blade. You know, now he's got the the full set, if you will, and we're about to see here in the in the Kaladin chapter that he's he's being taken on for for training. I'm I'm really interested to see if his condition keeps him from doing that, or if this will enable him to kind of overcome that. It seems like Renarin may start to play a, a little bit more important part than we've seen him play before. Transitioning. One thing I just go ahead. One, sorry, one thing I just thought about before we move on. This probably isn't very important, but what I've just kind of thought about with Adolin and Renarin and kind of the contrast. There's like similarities. Like they're they're both like you know kind of nice young men, I guess, um, sons of Dalinar, and I feel like each one kind of represents kind of the two sides of Dalinar's personality. Adolin is more of like the Blackthorn where he's, you know, the a great warrior, um, not super caring of what people think or do or anything like that. He, he doesn't care that much. Um, and it made me think about it whenever he said that Renarin kind of like freezes up mm-hmm. it, around battle. Um, that's kind of the new sign to Dalinar, where he goes to war that one time and freezes and has this big exit existential crisis in the middle of it yeah like what am i doing what's going on like this is horrible um and i feel like renarin kind of exemplifies that sign the more do what is right side of dalinar and so i feel like adolin and renarin combined can kind of it kind of fill fill up dalinar almost yeah i like that thought a lot so when Renarin gets his blade, he gets his blade from his brother and his plate from his father. And because Dalinar gave him his plate, gave Renarin his plate at the end of the Way of Kings, kind of as a ceremonious thing of I'm not going to be in battle anymore. That's not my role anymore. And so now that he has both, he has started training. And that's into chapter 16 here with the Kaladin chapter. But Kaladin is his job right now is to be bodyguards of the Colin family. He's at the dueling grounds with Adolin and Renarin, I believe. And Renarin is trying to get chosen from a swordmaster, but 
the dynamic is kind of strange there because they they need to choose him, but they're also Ardents under the Colin house, so they technically own them. So the whole the whole dynamic here is kind of strange. I got the impression that there's maybe a lot of tradition where perhaps it's kind of tradition for Alethi boys or a young Alethi men who want to become a warrior to you know enter into a an academy or or a, a, a training grounds like this and and have to earn the you know respect of a sword master and get picked by a sword master for them to take them on as as an apprentice and then they they train them them up into you know, become a become a warrior, but then, like you said, it's a a bit of a maybe a forced structure there, where yeah, the sword masters, yeah, they they pick the 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 students, but in reality, like you said, they're ardents, they're by the, these Alethi families, so they're ultimately servants. So maybe it's all a bit, a little bit of pomp and circumstance, and and the powerful Alethi families are always going to make sure that you know their boys get picked by the best sword masters, kind of thing, right? Not a lot of that's really talked about here, but I kind of got the impression maybe that's the that's the case with this and how this this works here. Because I think like the the swordmaster that Kaladin talks to here, he kind of tells Kaladin like, you know, who's going to say no to taking on Renarin? Because you're going to have to go face Dalinar and explain you wouldn't take on his own son right. as your your apprentice. So. Switching over to Kaladin. We get an, a dark side of Kaladin here. So Amram is back in the war camps, and Kaladin's not happy about it. Well, he kind of lies to himself and tells himself at the beginning of the chapter that he has decided that he is happy about it, because now he gets to kill him. And he originally says, yeah, I'm going to do it with a spear, because that's my weapon. And then he's like, no. I'm going to do it with a knife because that's up close and personal and gritty. And you're like, whoa, take it easy, take it easy there, buddy. It's, it'll be all right. Like, any any thoughts on this, these dark thoughts about Amram from Kaladin? So Amram is bringing out the worst feelings in Kaladin. He's the man who he probably loves the most. He even says that Amram is way worse than Sadius. Uh, because Sadius, everyone knows he's a he's a rat, but Amaram, you know, has a display or he feigns honor. He says, yeah, um, and he despises everything about him. And in his mind, he's the reason Tian is dead, and so he hates him a lot. Um, I don't know what to make about it. We we kind of knew he was going to hate him. Um, I guess the question is, how far is he going to go with it? Is he actually going to kill him or try to kill him? Or is he going to chill out um, or talk to Dalinar or what? Yeah, th this seems like this is going to be Kaladin's next big struggle. Is he going to try and, and get his revenge on Amaram? Or is he going to stick with his allegiance that he has now to to Dalinar and this is a huge wedge in that allegiance that he's he's sworn now and we we knew this was coming as soon as we saw Amram show up and as soon as we learned that Amram and Dalinar are our friends our buddy but but yeah Trevor you like you said this is this is dark this is uncharacteristically dark from from Kaladin we we've seen before Sill has has said that light eyes bring out the worst in in Kaladin and, and yep. Amram is the Amram is the, the the far end of that spectrum. He he's going to bring out the abs first in Kaladin, but yeah, if Kaladin goes down this path, I don't think it's going to end well. If Kaladin really tries to to murder, tries to tries to take out Amram, I, it's going to have some bad results, not just for Kaladin, but for probably all of his bridgemen as well. Yeah. So. Sill has had conversations with Kaladin in the past of kind of snapping him out of this light eyes hatred. This has happened before. And Kaladin gets a little dramatic here and says, well, Dalinar must be just as bad as Amaram because they're friends. And Sill stops him right there. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
look at me right in the eyes and tell me that again. And then he can't. Like, he, he realizes that, no, that's that's stupid. That Dalinar is not actually as bad as Amram just for being friends. Because Dalinar doesn't know. And if Dalinar knew, then that would be a different story. But he doesn't. And Amram is feign, feigning honor, as you said, Paul, for everybody. And everybody thinks that he 1v1'd a shard bearer without a shard himself. But no, that was actually Kaladin who did that. So... Do you guys think Kaladin should talk to Dalinar? Yes. Is he going to believe him? That's a good question. I was going to say, my biggest thought about this, so we briefly mentioned like what could happen if Kaladin does kill Amram. And if he does kill Amram... That's very bad, not just for him, but for everything going on, because Dalinar has fully put his trust in Kaladin and his men, and everyone is kind of like, whoa, what's she doing with all these dark guys like being high-ranked and stuff? Well, kind of. Not fully, mm -hmm. but I'm sure people are a little wary. Yeah, at for least. sure. Um, and so if Kaladin kills Amaranth, then everyone's going to be like, well, told, like, you know, dark guys are the worst. That We shouldn't have trusted these men and so everyone's probably going to get disbanded probably they're not going to be like oh well it was just we'll kick Kaladin out but keep him you know I feel like it would way more people's faith are in Kaladin's hand to do well than he's probably thinking he's thinking very rationally but yes he's talked about talk to Dalinar I don't Dalinar would be slow to believe it, but I think he would listen and believe. Um, probably. There's a I, there's a catch here that is very important. If Kaladin kills Amaram, you have to think about it from everybody's perspective of who they think Amaram is. They think Amaram is the honorable guy, the the person everybody says who whispers about, oh, that guy has never broken a promise, that type of thing. He is the honorable, light-eyed high, high marshal. And if Kaladin just comes out of the blue and says, this guy is a, a filthy liar and a murderer, or even worse, he just straight up kills him without with, without any proof, or, or without any proof of his story, everybody's gonna be like, whoa, whoa, why'd you kill that guy? That, everybody likes him. Like, what, what are you doing, bro? Yeah, I mean, because there were no witnesses, at least no witnesses that are going to what Amram did when he betrayed him because he killed all of, of Kaladin's man, men, it it would ultimately come down to it, Amram's word versus Kaladin's word. And right. like you said, pretty much everyone's going to side with Amram based on his, his reputation. But I agree with you, Paul, and that I think... Kaladin needs to say something to Dalinar sooner rather than later. And and maybe he doesn't need to come all the way out and accuse Amram of of what he did and, and tell try to tell the full story. But if it is going to come down to a Amram's word versus Kaladin's word, Kaladin's going to have a way better case if he speaks up sooner rather than later. If it comes down to an accusation from Amram and Kaladin just turns that around as, you know, oh, you're actually the one that betrayed him. It's just going to look like he's retaliating. Whereas if he, if he if he plants that seed now with Dalinar of, hey man, I know more about this guy than than most people and, and you trust him that that might be enough for to help out his case a lot later on down the line. So I I think he should say something. Definitely. I'll leave it there for Either now. Either way. Either way, it tends. No matter how this goes down, it's it's not going to be clean. I mean, I'm thinking about this. I think we talked about this before from Amram's perspective. It's been what did they say, seven days now or something like that since yep since Amram has shown up. If Amram recognizes Kaladin, if he's seen him and remembers him, which we expect he's going to, because because Kaladin has the brands on his on his forehead yep. that mark him as as who he is. Amram's going to have a lot of 
incentive to cover his back pretty quickly and tell, you know, down our, some kind of story about, Oh, you can't trust this guy. Uh, Amram hasn't said something to down already. I'm going to be pretty, pretty surprised. So this, this seems like something that's going to come to a head sooner rather than later. So keep in mind that Amram is from the Sadius Princedom. Uh, Hearthstone is from Sadius's part of, for, of Alethkar. That's where Kaladin and his his squad would have been is Sadius's army had they made it to the, the Shattered Plains. So Amram is actually staying in Sadius's war camp. In he's part of Sadius's army. He is, however, good friends with Dalinar. So that's when. So when he showed up, he went to go see Dalinar. But he's actually staying in Sadius's camp. So there okay. is there isn't actually a lot of cross between Kaladin and Amram like between the two of them they they're not going to see each other very often yeah it's going to get awkward <laughs> one of those one of those double takes walking through the hallway next to each other like wait you're that guy that i enslaved oops <laughs> you oh, well. you me All right, we can talk a little bit more about Syl and her dislike of shard blade. Well, there's a distinction here. She doesn't dislike shard blades. She dislikes people that have shard blades. Anyone want to pick this up before I explain a little bit? So this seemed like an answer, actually, to a, a question that I've had, because Syl's mentioned this before, like shard blades. And I... I noted that is odd because if Sills and Honor Spren, like the Honor Spren of old, we're assuming, who used to be companions of the Knights Radiant, the Knights Radiant of old wielded shard blades all the time. And Caledon points this out in this this scene that we see here. He says, How can you have a problem with this? The Knights Radiant always had shard blades. And and Sill explains a little bit, well, I don't have a problem with shard blades. I have a problem with the the shard bearers. And she it answers a question, but in, in classic Brandon Sanderson style, it, it opens up a new question. And that question is, she, she specifically says, well, it's really the knight I have a problem with. And it, it's not the knights of old that I have a problem with. It's the fact that the knights changed, that it's the, the new people that wield shard blades that I have a problem with. And that that makes me wonder, do the Spren feel like they've been back at the the day of of recreance when the knights walked away from their 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 shards in that vision we saw that Dalinar saw we saw this happen we've been told that they're betraying mankind in doing so that they're perhaps like walking away from the battle and and stepping down from their role as protectors but what if that's not necessarily the case what if it's actually the spren that they betrayed what if that they were working with wanted them to do something or somehow there was some kind of conflict of interest and the knights themselves not on that of the spren and somehow broke their bonds or did something that now the spren feel betrayed because it seems like sills carrying a chip on her for knights who carry shard blades at least that's the impression i'm getting and now it's it's reshaping maybe a little bit of how i think about that event so we know that the old Knights Radiant of old had Spren, like Kaladin, like Shalon, uh, like Yasna had. And so when they stepped down during the Day of Recreants or the Recreants or whatever they, they call it, they're not only abandoning mankind to whatever they were fighting, they're us like we're assuming they're abandoning their spren that they had bonded with to like to just leave them so you're right like sill definitely has a chip on your chip on her shoulder as you're saying so there's a there's a compounding factor to this as well and i'm scanning through my notes to find the the exact quote but 
the Parshendi because the Parshendi have an interesting relationship with Spren as well. They they also seem to kind of use Spren in certain ways. They 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 have to like bond with Spren when they when they change forms. But I'm trying to look back through it. But in one of the interludes that we just had, they made some kind of a mention to like betrayal of the Spren or something like that. So I'm I'm curious if they're part of the equation as well. Do it, it seems like the Spren feel like they've been betrayed. Mankind feels like they've been betrayed, and the Parshendi feel like they've been betrayed. What happened, and is it all connected? I feel like it might. It, it probably is. Oh no, there it is. I, I see it now in my notes. What they actually say is that the Spren betray us. The Parshendi do so. The the Parshendi feel like the Spren have betrayed them, which is, yeah, a big old triangle of betrayal, perhaps. And the Alethi feel like they've been betrayed by the Parshendi, quite recently, yes. because they made a a peace treaty with them, and then two hours later they killed Gavilar. Yep. And then the Spren feel like they've been betrayed by humankind. So. I need to need to make a little diagram of like yeah we need a little uh, a bunch of arrows be- pointing betrayal triangle. All right, any any closing thoughts on episode twenty eight? I've, I've been spewing a lot of thoughts, but I do have one more to mention real quick, and that's summing up a lot of this. Actually, is a comment that Syl gives to to Kaladin when he asks for, you know, why can't you just explain it to me? You know, tell me, tell me what happened and why. And and Syl's response back to her is is classic. Trevor, this probably should be your new line. She's like, I can't tell you. Why not? She's like, Well, it doesn't work that way. That's just not how it, it works. Imp- <laughs> right. Im- implying implying that she knows that that she knows all the answers. She just for some reason refuses to give them to him. So, because the plot couldn't work if I told you, Kaladin. <laughs> the, much. There's, I, I think it's funny that you know all those YouTube uh, channels and stuff that you know tear apart movies and and stories like that. Well, like find plot holes, and and Brandon Sanderson here is like, well, I I understand that this is a problem for my heroes. I'm just gonna say it. So that nobody else says it. Like, why can't Syl just tell him about it? It's not how it works. And that's what I'm going to say about it. (laughs) The end. Don't Don't ask me about it. Don't tell me this is a plot hole because that's not how it works. Right. I wonder wonder if there was like a fan at a signing for the Way of Kings. And so one of the fans asked him that, and so he just wrote that in real quick in the in words of radio. It's just like <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. Moving on. But I feel I feel like that's the answer we get from you, Trevor, all the time. Is is Paul and I are always asking, well, well, well why why this and and why that? And did you just tell us it's not how it works? I can't tell you. Yep. I'll I'll be Silfrena if you guys if one of you guys wants to be Kaladin. Alrighty. I'll pass. <laughs> Kidding. As long as I don't have to be Shalon. <laughs> you are a resident we, Shalon. We've, we've established this. I of. am, aren't I? Kind of. Alright, any, any closing thoughts on episode 28? I thought it was really cool that Adolin had his own chapter. And I kind of hope we keep seeing that. I'm assuming we will. I don't know if it'll just be for duels. That's what I'm assuming. Also curious, as a closing thought, with this Adolin duel chapter, I assume he's going to have more in the future. I'm going to assume that they're not going to be as easy as this one. And I'm curious to see if something goes wrong. I would kind of a bold prediction, but I'm going to say something's going to go really wrong and... Maybe Adolin will die in a duel. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, 
Kaladin is ready for it. He he shows up to that training, and he's like, literally anything could go wrong in these trainings. And it's part of Kaladin being, you know, overly protective bodyguard dude. But mm-hmm. you're right that anything could go wrong during these duels. So one touch of the shard blade, and you're done. So it's true. Alrighty, well, I think we can call it there for episode. 28. Thanks for joining me, Paul and Elliot, and we will reconvene next week. Until our paths cross again. Arrivederci. That's by an Italian, a formal goodbye in Italian, so...